The work of Professor George Paxinos in mapping the human brain has been recognised globally. And today, the Greek-Australian neuroscientist is in Canberra presenting a set of his cartography books to Parliament's library. His work has had a profound impact on medicine and he's now investigating the question, is the brain the right size. George Paxinos joins us now from Canberra. Welcome, George. So can we start with why you decided it was necessary to map the brain and how did you do it? Uh, we uh, have an interest in uh, studying the human brain for clinical reasons and uh, uh, the brain of animals, experimental animals, for reasons of uh, allowing scientists to construct animal models of disease. Uh, scientists love nothing more than uh, establishing uh, an animal model of, the, of a disease inspired by human considerations such as uh, diseases such as uh, Alzheimer's, uh, epilepsy. They want to construct the same thing in the uh, mouse or the rat uh, and uh, then uh, they have control that they can study it. So we uh, provide the maps uh, like a Google map for the brain of the human in experimental animals and allow scientists to navigate between these brains and test their hypotheses. What about this question that uh, you say has troubled you for some 50 years? Is the brain the right size? What answers have you arrived at so far? Yes, it's an invitation to reflect uh, not only on the powers of the brain, but also on its limitations, uh, the fact uh, uh, that the brain uh, is really the result of uh, a hereditary endowment, a genetic endowment, and the environmental influences that have molded uh, the brain. And the brain was really constructed many, many years ago, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, to deal with uh, issues that are not uh, current. Uh, other things are now uh, the difficulties that we have to overcome, including environmental damage. Uh, and uh, just if you consider for a moment, if the brain uh, was uh, smaller than what it is, it, it, like the chimpanzee brain, it wouldn't have been able to construct um, uh, the technology which today threatens existence. If it were larger than what it is, it might have been able to understand the problem, even solve it. So it's, it's really, the brain, in my view, is not the right size, just to reflect and uh, avoid the hubris to think that we are really uh, uh, in the image of, made in the image of God. Mm. The human condition, I guess. Uh, you say you've, uh, you have done a lot of work combating diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Are you optimistic, Professor, that these conditions can be stopped? Well, uh, yeah, the atlases that uh, have been constructing at Neuroscience Research Australia are used by other people to study uh, the causes and, and amelioration or prediction of the course of uh, the disease, diagnosis of the disease. And yes, there are improvements uh, and there might be, in the case of Alzheimer's, there might uh, be uh, a, a way of uh, uh, retarding uh, the progression of the disease. Uh, to actually uh, cure the disease, I can't see it happening because the damage to the neurons has already occurred. Now, you spoke about the influence of genes and environment on a brain's development, but what do you make of individuals like the late Stephen Hawking, whose intellect was so far above everybody else's that we could hardly understand the questions he was trying to answer? What would be different about his brain to the rest of us? Well, there definitely would be uh, something different uh, uh, about his brain, much like Einstein's brain, except that nobody has found anything that correlates well uh, with this exceptional performance. Uh, there has to be something physical or chemical, uh, functional, but it uh, has not been identified yet what uh, produces genius that separates, uh, uh, is different from us. Professor George Paxton, fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rose.